There was a famous 16th century English poet called Thomas Tusser who coined the phrase, a fool and their money are soon parted. And this has never been truer than for some relatively intelligent people who were fooled by con men. Some of the scams throughout history were so outrageous they left people dumbstruck by the sheer audacity of the scheme and left authorities wondering how people could be so gullible to fall for such a con. But plenty did. The following three men managed to con people with such brazen deceit that they will leave you totally gobsmacked. Number three, Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn was born in 1952 in Israel and claims to be a faith healing evangelical and also claims that his other gift is prophecy. The following are a few of his better known predictions. God will kill all homosexuals by fire. Well, that's not very Christian. Castro will die in the 1990s. You got that wrong, he died in 2016. An earthquake would destroy the American East Coast in the 1990s. Obviously it didn't. Jesus Christ himself was going to make a personal appearance at Hinn's African Crusade. He never made it. It goes to show that you can make people believe anything, because after all these terrible inaccuracies, followers had still donated millions to Hinn. As with many faith healers, Hinn performed his miracles by touching people on the head, where they then fell to the ground, apparently healed, but not really then struts around the stage claiming victory. In November 2004, with the aid of hidden cameras and witnesses, CBC television showed how Hinn was a fraud. Hinn's staff would choose audience members to come on stage to proclaim their miracle healings. Yet, the genuine miracle speakers who attended a Hinn crusade, i.e. anyone shown obvious physical disability, were never allowed up on stage and those who attempted to get in line to be healed were intercepted and sent back to their seats. In 2006, he sent out the following letter to his followers. We have recently taken delivery of our Gulfstream G4SP plane, which we call Dove One. I have enclosed a beautiful photo filled brochure to explain more about this incredible ministry tool that will increase the scope of our abilities to preach the gospel around the globe. Now, we must pay the remainder of the down payment and I'm asking the Lord Jesus to speak to 6,000 of my precious partners to sow a seed of $1,000 in the next 90 days. And I am praying, even as I write this letter, that you will be one of them. He bought the jet and critics accused him of using the ministry's Gulfstream G4S4 jet for personal vacations funded by tax-free donations. If you think his brazen antics would have made people open their eyes to this con man, you are wrong because the guy is still at it. And by the way, Hin also lives in a $10 million mansion and drives a Mercedes SUV. And guess who paid for all this? Number two, Victor Lustig. Lustig was born in 1890 in Austria-Hungary and conducted scams across Europe and the United States during the early 20th century. As a youth, he was exceptionally gifted and upon leaving school, he applied both his education and his fluency in multiple languages to embark on a life of crime. He successfully conducted a variety of scams which gained him property and money and transformed him into a professional con man. In the early days, his cons were committed on ocean liners that sailed between France and New York City. In one scheme, he would con rich travellers by posing as a musical producer, seeking investment in a non-existent Broadway production, and had changed his name to Count Victor Lustig. In 1925, Lustig travelled to France and was involved in one of the greatest cons in history. He had read a newspaper article about the problems they were facing with maintaining the Eiffel Tower. The tower was falling into disrepair and the city was finding it expensive 
to maintain and repaint. But there was an article in the newspaper that caught his attention, where the authorities were calling for its possible removal. After reading the article, Lustig set to work preparing the scam, which included hiring a forger to produce fake government stationery for him. When that had been completed, Lustig invited a small group of scrap metal dealers to a confidential meeting at an expensive hotel, where in the meeting he identified himself to them as a Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Posts and Telegraphs. He managed to convince the men that the upkeep of the Eiffel Tower was becoming too much for Paris and that the French government wished to sell it for scrap. However, he emphasised to the men that this must not be disclosed to the public, as there would be a public outcry. In order to carry out his scam, he chose a man called André Poisson, who he claimed showed the most interest in purchasing the monument and also appeared the most greedy and gullible. With some fast, skillful talking, he managed to get Poisson to pay a large bribe to secure ownership of the Eiffel Tower. Once Lustig received his bribe and the funds for the monument, supposed sale, he fled to Austria. Whilst in Austria, Lustig would check newspapers to see if Poisson had reported the scam to the police and figured he'd be safe as Poisson would be too ashamed to admit he'd been conned. When he found nothing about the scam in the papers, he felt it safe to return to France and pull off another scheme. However, when he attempted to con another group of dealers with the same con, unlike Poisson, the police were informed about the scam and sought to arrest him. Lustig fled to the United States to evade capture. Another one of Lustig's famous scams involved selling a box that he claimed was a machine that could duplicate any currency bills that were inserted into it and could print an identical copy. It was called the Romanian box. The box's design featured two small slots designed to take in bills and the paper to print the duplicate on and a compartment containing a false arrangement of levers and mechanisms that had to be operated to make the duplicates. Lustig would ask his victims to give him a specific denomination of bill, then would insert it into his device along with the paper, and then they would wait until the duplicate was made. When it was ready, Lustig would take the bill with him to a bank to authenticate it. In reality, the victim would be unaware of the fact that Lustig had concealed a genuine note within the device. The choice of denomination was influenced by what he'd put into the box. Once the poor victim was convinced, Lustig would refuse to sell them the box until they offered him a high price for it. Before it was sold, Lustig would pack the box with additional genuine notes to buy him time to make a clean escape before his victim realised they had been conned. For all his misdeeds, Lustig was eventually caught, pleaded guilty at his trial and was sentenced to 15 years in Alcatraz Island, where he ironically served alongside Al Capone who he had previously conned, but for some reason, Capone spared his life. On March the 9th, 1947, Lustig contracted pneumonia and died two days later. On his death certificate, his occupation was listed as apprentice salesman. Number 1. George C. Parker George C. Parker was born in New York City in 1860 and was an American con man who had many aliases from James O'Brien, Warden Kennedy, Mr. Roberts and Mr. Taylor. Parker was famous for selling the Brooklyn Bridge on the premise that whoever owns the bridge would gain financially by charging people to use it and police would move several of his victims from the bridge as they tried to erect toll booths. He made money by conducting illegal sales of property he did not own, including the selling of New York's public landmarks to unsuspecting immigrants. Other public landmarks he tried to sell included the original Madison Square Garden, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Grant's Tomb and the Statue of Liberty, and used various methods for selling. When he sold Grant's Tomb, he would pose as the general's grandson, and he even set up a fake office to handle his real estate scams. 
he would produce forged documents as evidence to suggest that he was the legal owner of whatever property he was selling. He was also able to successfully sell shows and plays of which he had no legal ownership. Of course, you can only do so much scamming until the law catches up with you. And that's exactly what they did. However, Parker even managed to con them, where after one arrest in 1908, he escaped the courthouse by calmly walking out after stealing a sheriff's hat and coat that had been set down by a sheriff who had just walked in from outdoors. After his third conviction on December the 17th, 1928, he was sentenced to a mandatory life term at Sing Sing Prison. He spent the last eight years of his life incarcerated there and was popular among guards and fellow inmates who enjoyed hearing of his exploits. Parker is remembered as one of the most successful con men in the history of the United States, as well as one of history's most talented hoaxers. <laughs>